there's a lot of a lot of real threats out there. And for, for us, you know, for, for my part of NSA, we're not just concerned about the threats that are, are facing our agency. We have a role under NSD 42 to assist with really all national security systems and to uh, oversee the safeguarding of all of them. So we have to look at, at the very broad spectrum. So I'm just going to hit a few big themes, I think, in, in terms of what threats are changing today and how they're evolving. But the very notion of saying, okay, what's this biggest threat? And I'm going to sort of spend some time on that. That's important. But we also have to think about the fact that the threats are constantly changing. So the biggest threat is really the fact that the threats never stay constant. But okay, so specific specific areas. First one is uh, the speed at which all attackers are operating. Whichever type of malware they're using, whatever tradecraft they're using, all of our, our threat actors are accelerating their operations. Um, a very good example of that would be the delay from when a patch is released to when you see new malware coming after uh, people that didn't uh, apply that patch. And that's gone from you know, weeks originally or days to now it's in a small number of hours. And there's no technical reason why it couldn't get faster yet. Uh, another um, big thing, and, and some speakers here at the uh, Federal Summit or Public Sector Summit today have, have mentioned this, is we're seeing a much greater emphasis on uh, uh, obfuscation and customization of malware. Uh, and all other sort of threat artifacts, not just the malware itself. You're seeing a lot more stuff that's tailored. You're seeing a lot more stuff that is um, made unique per uh, recipient or per victim so that a, um, a type of defense that depends on spotting artifacts that were used against uh, other targets is becoming less effective. And lastly, uh, something that's very scary aspect of the threat environment that we live in is that the threat actors are crawling further upstream. So instead of simply attacking the end victim that perhaps has some intellectual property they wish to steal or has some um, you know, monetary artifact that they, they want to get uh, as, as a monetization vehicle, they're, they're crawling upstream to security providers, to identity providers, um, uh, uh, open source consortia, all sorts of other avenues that will help make their operations scale. Okay, and, and there have been examples of this. Um, most recent one I saw out in the open press was against uh, uh, Bit9, and that was, uh, I forget, several weeks ago. Anyway, and that's an example of the, the, the bad guys, the threat actors saying, gee, you know, uh, pr this particular defensive technology is making my job harder. So instead of simply getting better at evading that one, I'm going to actually crawl upstream and attempt to disable it or subvert it. And that's a very scary trend that is really going to make us pay attention to all the elements of our sort of defensive uh, uh, ecosystem, not just the endpoints that attackers may go after. In government, wow. Uh, I'm not sure it'll be that different from, from everybody else, but. Specifically in government, the, the one word I would use is, is federated. Uh, today, you see, to, to some extent, each federal agency or, or department kind of go in it on their own. And of course, they all work with commercial partners, and they get a, a products and tools and threat intelligence from, from various sources. But what I think we're going to see in the future is um, both the uh, government public sector entities and the private sector entities they work with doing a lot more real-time uh, federated defense. My, uh, my old colleague, uh, Tony Sager, who's now at uh, SANS, had a saying, uh, let my detection become your prevention. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that, where uh, all of us, you know, uh, the DOD and uh, DHS and Department of Transportation and Department of Labor uh, are all going to become sensors in this sort of big federated space. Um, and one of the critical enablers for that will be uh, uh, machine speed or automated uh, threat intelligence interchange. So with the recent executive order, you saw a mandate for NIST to create a framework. That's what they're talking about. A framework in which uh, uh, public to public and public to private and vice versa uh, interactions can proceed at machine speed. And that's, I think, what the future is really holding. It's going to get away from uh, I know about a threat, so I call my counterpart in another agency on the phone.
to, I know about a threat, and because I put rules in place ahead of time, you know, 500 milliseconds after I know about that threat, that uh, information about it is sent at machine speed to the partners that I work with, uh, uh, other agencies, private sector, law enforcement, etc. There's a lot out there, and, and I'm sure that uh, you get a lot of the sort of the same answers from folks when you, when you ask that question. I'm going to try to hit a couple that I think are maybe a little um, more unusual. The first is everybody talks about, uh, about mobility, right, and how that's going to change our information environment, and I think that's true. There's an aspect of that evolution that worries me, and that is um, that the platforms that are popular uh, and that are kind of taking over and are very widely used in that mobile endpoint space are not yet set up to be uh, defensible. In this, and you're starting to see progress. I don't want to say that the companies involved aren't making progress. They are, but there's still a long ways to go. Uh, um, we need better capabilities in that space for uh, uh, foundations of trust, uh, kind of from the hardware or firmware on up through the operating system and into the apps. And we need better, uh, I'd say, hooks or APIs or vehicles for additional defensive measures, sensors, uh, response mechanisms to be added to these platforms, right? And we have that to a very great degree in what you might call the, the desktop and server ecosystems. We don't yet have it in the mobile ecosystem, and that worries me a great deal. Uh, the second one I think is going to be a real sleeper issue I've been trying to worry about it on and off since about 2004, is uh, um, adoption of IPv6. And you're really starting to see a tipping point. It's a bit later than I expected, possibly because of the uh, economic downturn. But you're starting to see it today. Um, and I'm worried not because the, the IPv6 protocol is inherently insecure. It's not. It has some, some features that are nice. But I'm worried about it because it is a new part of our ecosystem and our defensive um, practices and conventions and training and, and sort of everything that goes into the human side of defending our networks, I'm worried may not be ready to defend a network that's uh, based on both IPv4 and IPv6. There are enough technical differences that you can't just take somebody who's an expert at, at IPv4 and defending in an IPv4 network just plunk them down in a, in a dual stack network and say go. There's a lot of uh, um, new technology, new tradecraft that we're going to need and I'm not sure we have it yet. So that worries me. The, the thing that worries me about hacktivists is not that, that you know, there are people who are, are taking up cyber tools in order to try to uh, um, make those sorts of points. That's, in some sense, inevitable, right? But that um, it increases, in a sense, the diversity of that threat actor ecosystem, which is going to help increase their, uh, um, you might say, uh, innovation rate. And that worries me. <laughs> um, also, with uh, uh, hacktivists, you're reaching out to folks who may have uh, talents or, or skills who might not uh, be willing to support a criminal enterprise, but might uh, uh, ideologically say, hey, I'm going to bring my talents and skills to this activity. And um, that, that can't be a good thing. I wish I could reach out to some of those folks and say, you know, hey, you have talents and skills. You know, consider coming to government and, and kind of fighting the good fight from our side. Uh, you know, and I do a lot of outreach to universities, and I talk to a lot of uh, students who are studying this stuff in school and I say you know if you want technical challenges and you want to uh, make a difference the way to do that is from the government side you can come in you can have hard hard problems to work on and you know that your hard work on those problems is going to make a difference <laughs>